The thing that Page and Podium has allowed us to do is not only bring people's books to market, which we do, but also help them get them written in the first place. Your zone of genius, you know, may not be writing and that's totally fine. We all have different things that we bring to the table. And what we have with Page and Podium is a whole group of book industry professionals who are there to help fill in the gaps on, on the places where people may not be successful in publishing their book. You're listening to the Woman of Value podcast. You are about to hear the story of a woman who is following her dreams and passions and creating positive change in the world. My guest today is Amanda Edgar. She is an award-winning author and the CEO of Page and Podium Press, a publishing house that offers coaching, writing, and publishing services to self-defined leaders of all types, political leaders, industry and thought leaders, and community leaders. Her company focuses on projects that inspire leaders to take action, to build their communities, and to fearlessly shape society for a better tomorrow. I love that. Welcome to the podcast, Amanda. Thank you so much for having me, Sandy. What does a woman of value mean to you? Well, I love this as an opening question because it made me think. So the thing that that is so important to me when we're thinking about value is, of course, we all have inherent value just as human people. But I think where that gets dropped so often, especially with women, is in understanding our own value. And that has really been a theme in my journey is just thinking about how we throughout the course of our lives, we'll go in and out of these periods where we feel really comfortable embracing who we are and what we bring to the table. But then in my experience, we'll have dips too, where we were a little bit uncertain, maybe a career change or some other life change where we have trouble recognizing the value that we bring. So what I would say is I think a woman of value is is everyone. It's just we sometimes maybe wouldn't identify ourselves that way. Hmm. I like this very different from what most people share, but I I think that that idea of waxing and waning in how we value ourselves or appreciate our value is a really interesting way to look at it. Very, very true. Mm -hmm. I am thinking of so many times in my own life, as you said this, where I either really understood my value or underplayed my value or didn't have a voice and didn't know how to express my values. So I think many people will be able to really resonate with your message of what woman of value means to you. Yeah, I think I talk a lot about the curse of expertise and the fear of visibility and how those collide so often where we think, oh, I can do this thing so easily. Surely everyone else can too. Often not the case. And then you know, that gets compounded by this fear of really coming out and saying, hey, I have something to say, because of course, we're so afraid, well, maybe this isn't that special, or maybe everybody else thinks about this all the time, maybe I'm going to look silly. And I, I find that those things are really cyclical, that when we start getting into that cycle, it's really hard to get out and, and find our value. But, you know, that's the healing, and that's the self-care and the self-love. It's so important. Yeah, this paradox of we want to be seen and then we're petrified to be seen. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I when I started my own business after my divorce, I never had been in front of a camera or a microphone. I mean, those were the, the two scariest things for me. And I was really comfortable being behind the scenes. And I realized that I had a voice and I needed to express my voice and in order to be found, you have to, you have to write, you have to be seen, you have to be heard, you have to do all these things that are scary, but it also is a way to contribute. And I think that for a lot of us, we think it's showy. We deal with this with social media a lot where people say, well, it's really narcissistic to share all these things. And I, I read recently from Adam Grant had a post about this and he said, there's a big difference between sharing because you want people to just look at you and sharing because you want to contribute to others. And I think that's such an important distinction. Oh, that's so well said. Yeah, absolutely. So speaking of that, let's talk about you and your pivotal moment, that moment where you started to really appreciate your own value. 
Yeah. Well, I think, you know, for me, I've had several careers. Um, I started in theater and I was, I wanted to act. I did that for a while, but then it's of course much more lucrative <laughs> if you could do the behind the scenes stuff. Um, I was an academic for a long time. And now of course I'm a business owner and writer and coach. Um, and so I had to really think about what were the points that I wanted, or what was the point that I wanted to highlight. And for me, the most recent one was the one that speaks, I think, most to this question. So I was university professor for a long time, and I had literally all of the accolades I could have had at that time. So I had um, really outpublished most anybody that was in my field at my my level of my career. Um, I had two books out, both had won national awards. I had two more book contracts. Um, I had won the national and the regional award in my field. Everybody was telling me you're bringing so much value. This is what you're doing is so important. I just could not hear it. And I think in academia and so many other worlds as well, there's it's always the next thing, you know? So we, okay, well, I've got to get the job. Okay, well, I got the job. Well, now I've got to get tenure. Okay, well, now I've got tenure. Well, now I've got to get this award. And I I was in a really unhealthy spiral. And the thing that I that I come back to now when I, I look back is what I really wanted to do in academia was help other people become successful. I wanted to coach. I wanted to mentor. I really wanted to work with graduate students. That was why I'd had to publish so much to get the job I wanted. Um, but, you know, mentoring has to have good and bad parts. You have to let people know if they're not on the right course, if they're doing something that's going to be harmful to themselves. And I was working with an older man. And I realized that we needed to, you know, have a talk about some things he was doing that were self-sabotaging that were going to block his his future that he was uh, that he wanted. So I spent all day gathering all the advice. I checked in with my therapist and said, "Okay, these are the things I'm seeing. You know, what kinds of advice can I give?" I talked to other colleagues and, you know, how how can I help this person? What resources do we have? And I was so ready for this conversation really ready to team up with him. And we were going to knock out all of these future goals. And he had barely sat down in my office when he just started screaming. And it was about 40 minutes later that someone came and knocked on the door and, um, you know, said, oh, hey, are you okay? And, you know, he left and all the, the curse words and everything. But I was so shaken by that. And not just by the interaction, but by the fact that no one had come to check on me. No one had, um, you know, no one seemed to think there was any need to follow up with this afterwards on his behavior. And sometimes I think it takes something really big like that to shock us into understanding the value that we bring. Um, and what I realized was I had been over delivering to such an extent and it was completely lost on him. I had made myself so small, trying to make him so big that he couldn't even see me. So I had been ghostwriting for some time um, and I had coached as well. And I started thinking, you know, the people that that I work with in that side of my life, they are so appreciative. I, I would get emails all the time or, you know, we'd be on a call and they would say, you know what you said last week, I've thought about that all week and it helped me in, you know, X, Y, Z way. And at that point, you know, it was, I, I had to make a, a really clear stance, I think, just out of loyalty to myself that I had to say, I am more valuable than that. I am someone that, that everyone should want on their team. And I had to realize that I was the one that wasn't seeing that. So that really led me to what we're working on now with Page and Podium. Great story. Yeah, we get these like massive wake up calls sometimes mm -hmm. and some of us pay attention some of us don't but um that sounds really traumatizing especially since you spent so much time preparing and making sure that you were going to do the right thing and give him constructive feedback that was going to be in his service not screaming at him and telling him you're a jerk um, <laughs> which is what some people do yes absolutely <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's and I think that that contrast was what really it like you said it was a wake up call. I really needed to be able to see the value that I was bringing through my own eyes. And yeah, that moment just really made me realize that it had been a long time since I had really thought about things that way. Yeah, and it's easy to be in a in a space where you're underappreciated and over-delivering. I think that's also 
very common for us women who are brought up to over deliver, overdo and not be appreciated. And we kind of go through life unless we really make a change. It's easy to stay there and just think that's, that's our duty. That's the way it is. And it's not going to get any better, but you were courageous enough to say, I need to make a change. I'm more valuable than my old career and doing this is not working anymore. I want to be valued like the ghostwriters value me. So take us to what happened next in your career. Well, yeah. And and I want to say too, that I think, I think one of the, the takeaways that I have from this over delivering and being underappreciated is that it's, it is a cycle as well, because I think when we position our value as outside of ourselves, we will chase it forever. And I had been working with uh, one of my, actually one of my very first clients um, that I ghost wrote her book and then she, she's published it. Um, And she is a career consultant who had left a career because she was in a toxic workplace and a terrible environment. So I'd written her book with her. And one of my favorite parts about this job is that I get to learn all these brilliant things from the authors that I work with before anybody else ever gets to read the book. And she had said something to me that has stuck with me. And she said, they will let you die trying to change them. And I've seen that. I've seen that that we will be in these toxic, toxic places, but we see it as our responsibility to heal them or our responsibility, you know, our political um, alignment that we have to make this a more hospitable place or a kinder place. And sometimes you just can't. Sometimes the place is what it is and the people are, are what they are. And the only thing that you can do is run. That's such a good point. I, I'm working with a woman right now in her dating and relationship part of her life. And she just had a work uh, experience that was a wake up call for her. She had been working so hard all year. She was promised a huge bonus for bringing in so much money in her career. And at the end of the year, doing the year end review, they kind of was, were like, well, we'll see if we can get that bonus for you. And she's like, what do you mean we'll see? I've been working this hard because you promised this. And they said, well, we'll try. And she's like, that's not going to work for me. So it's, it was a wake-up call for her to, to pay attention to the fact that this company really wasn't looking for her out for her best interest. And also, she had other dreams that she wanted to get to. And this was sort of that catalyst that, oh, well, I'm not going to get my needs met here. I've made good money so far in my life. And now I have this security to go off and do what I really want to do. And for a lot of people, they need that. They need that push, that kick in the pants that you can't change a company that from the top down, it's dysfunctional. They don't care. They care more about the bottom line than they care about people. Yeah. Absolutely. I love that story. She followed her dreams. Yes. Yes. So we're, we're going to work on that in the coming year, making those, taking those steps to get her to have that dream come true. And, you know, often there isn't that security that people are looking for. And I, I, you know, sort of can compare that to leaving my marriage. I did not have a, a job yet. I had a lot of little jobs. I had just started certification and coaching and I just, I knew that somehow I was going to make it. I didn't know how it took a long time, but I kept following the right path. And because this career was so important to me that I, I just did everything in my power to get the support I needed and to keep going when other people would have given up. So tell us about how you made your career happen, because this is a big pivot for you. Yes. Well, it's interesting. In some ways, my previous career really set me up for this job. So um, I founded, we had a, a company called DAS Author Services. Um, and recently, um, I guess just about six months ago. Um, At this point, we rebranded. And so our company is called Page and Podium Press. And as you said in the intro, we work with all kinds of leaders. And the important part to me about setting out on this path is 
I have seen so many people that were just like me that had all everything going for them, had so many amazing ideas, fresh perspectives to bring to the world, but really just felt like the best they could do was kind of prop up other people, make themselves, like I said, make themselves very, very small so that other people could shine. And the thing that Page and Podium has allowed us to do is not only bring people's books to market, which we do, but also help them get them written in the first place. Your zone of genius, you know, may not be writing and that's totally fine. We all have different things that we bring to the table. And what we have with Page and Podium is a whole group of book industry professionals. We have writers, editors, designers, marketers who are there to help fill in the gaps on, on the places where people may not be successful in publishing their book. And to me, that is such a perfect translation of what I was trying to do in my last job. I was trying to prop people up and I was trying to lift them up. And in academia, there is a real sense of, you know, wanting to do everything yourself, not only in academia, but there's a real sense that if you bring on team members, if you bring on support, then you are somehow lesser, that really we should be on our own. And the message of Page and Podium is not only is that not going to serve you, you're not going to get the results that you want, but it also is not politically aligned with what most of the leaders I talk to even really want. It's just so hard to see in ourselves that we need that support the way that we would encourage other people to get that kind of support. Yeah. So the people who are propping up others are now propping themselves up with the right support. That's and right. That's it's right. An important, it's an important message. Support is something that, again, we were taught, do it yourself or don't ask. It's too vulnerable right? To ask somebody to actually help you means that maybe you're too weak or incapable. Mm -hmm. And to me, it's the greatest sign of weak, of strength to ask for support because you're actually going to make something happen that you couldn't do on your own. And, you know, people hire people to help them in the gym. They hire people to help them with nutrition, but asking for help around these kinds of vulnerable areas can be really scary for people. And yet, a lot of people say, oh, I should write a book, and then they never do. So you're taking these dreams and making them realities, which is beautiful. Yeah, it has been such a gift to be able to, to do that kind of thing. And the thing that I, I think a lot of people don't realize about getting help with your writing and publishing is that a lot of times we have so many ideas. And to us, it's, like, oh, I've got 16 books. And people say that to me all the time. Oh, I've probably got five or six books. And oftentimes when we work through what are the stories and what are the things that brought you to this knowledge and how did you crystallize this idea? Oftentimes it's not. It's one very rich book that has a core theme where we can pull in all of these different insights in a way that feels so genuine and authentic to the person that the help really disappears into the product and it really becomes this amazing team effort to help more people than that person ever could have helped on their own. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I think also it is hard to distill what is the theme of your life? What are those common themes? And we, when I first started writing and speaking, I would include a million different things and really have a hard time with that part where it all felt connected. It all felt like it was part of the same thing, but you have to pull out, what are you really writing about? What are you really talking about? And find those, those pain points that we have addressed in our lives really. And to, if you're writing a, you know, a self-help book or a memoir, writing about your own process, it's just important to get somebody to help you to distill that because it is hard for us to see on our own. Yeah, that's exactly right. If you have ever played small to make other people feel comfortable, or maybe stayed in a bad relationship or job too long because you didn't think you could do any better, I wrote a book for you. It's called Becoming a Woman of Value, How to Thrive in Life and Love. Each of the 30 chapters contains a life lesson, a story, and an exercise to bring you closer to reaching your full potential. Becoming a Woman of Value is available on Amazon in paperback and Kindle.
you've got this new company, a new pivot and a new uh, kind of focus. What's your five-year plan or vision? So the big expansions that we're making right now is bringing on more people that can help support our authors. So we just made a really exciting hire with a woman who, um, she's a fiction writer actually by trade, but has been working with us on memoir for a long time. And her the way that she can describe these scenes in folks' lives in such vivid, visceral detail is just a gift. So I'm so excited uh, to have Emily on board. Um, we also launched earlier this year a new group program for women who want to write their own memoirs, but know again that they need those resources and that support. And it's a nine month program that we are taking women all the way through the stages of getting that memoir written, planned, developed, edited, published. Um, so I'm so proud of that program. It's called the Memoir Method. Um, and really, that is where we see the expansion happening in our company, is looking at not only providing excellent, excellent value for people who want the whole shebang, they want us to help with the whole entire process, but also expanding our services so that they're financially accessible to people who are not at that very top level of their career quite yet, but who have a huge vision for where they want to go. Really good idea to serve people at different levels because people do need support in different ways. And I think that was one of the most important things I learned as a businesswoman is how can I serve people both at a group level, at a private level, at a super private level. And most recently in my career as a dating and relationship coach, I became a wedding officiant to help officiate weddings that my clients are having. So it's sort of, you find these opportunities where you can then branch off into something else and offer a different service. What an amazing gift to have someone that you know so well that has walked you through the process, officiate the wedding. I love that. I'm so excited. Well, and it combines my new skills at public speaking, writing, and as a dating coach, having worked with this person and helped her overcome a lot of obstacles to get to where she is today with this guy, it would never have happened. I can guarantee you that she was so closed off. This particular mm. woman was told by her therapist that she was probably asexual because she wasn't attracted to anybody. And I was like, ah, how about we do a different approach here? <laughs> now, let's just see before we make that decision. <laughs> yes, let's, let's assess some stuff. <laughs> that's right. Oh, that's so yeah. great. I'm so honored. Um, but back to you. Let's let's go through the lightning round and learn a little bit more about you. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. I used to think I wasn't blank enough. From a good enough family. I, I mm. changed your syntax a little bit, but <laughs> I grew up working class. My parents both grew up pretty poor. And growing up, I really did not ever imagine that I, you know, could do anything but have a job. Um, hmm. So, you know, going into theater, that was my big moment of rebellion at the beginning of my career. And even then, you know, I thought I have made such a mistake. I can't have a family. I can't settle down. I was on a tour. So you are all over the place. I can't even have, you know, an apartment that I decorate really. Um, but even from there, it took me many, many years to imagine myself as someone who is a leader or that people, you know, particularly want to hear from or someone that that starts a business that's an entrepreneur. So I, in my, my mind growing up, it was very much those other people do that and we do this. And that was a real, that was a real barrier to overcome. I think I probably am still overcoming it. <laughs> that's, it's really interesting. The good enough family. I appreciate you bringing that to us today because I think so many can relate to that too. I, I often look at people in theater, now that you mentioned theater and people, actors who are huge stars today, but they come from very humble beginnings and it's good to see that. It's good to see people who have overcome limiting beliefs, overcome the beliefs of sometimes of family who say, just stick to something safe. Don't do something that's risky. And, um, you know, the client I was talking about before, you know, her family wanted her to stay in a safe profession and make good money. And that's fine for a while, but if you have dreams 
then you have to work through those limiting beliefs or, you know, whatever belief you're, you're coming to the table with. Yeah. The, the phrase that I heard growing up was you're getting above your raisin, Mm -hmm. uh, meaning, you know, the level at which you've been raised, you should not be, you know, thinking that you're better than that. And the nuance of that is of course, I'm not better. (laughs) No one's better than anybody else. We are all valuable people. But your dreams and aspirations are not limited to what your parents, you know, dreams and aspirations were. And credit to my incredible parents who pushed back on that phrase every single time it came up. (laughs) But, you know, these these are these are really powerful seeds that get planted in in our psyches. So, yeah, absolutely limiting beliefs. Yeah. When you said raisin, I was thinking of a dried up grape. (laughs) Interesting. You're above your dried up grape. (laughs) (laughs) It is a, it is a very, I, I'm, uh, I grew up working class in the Midwest and it is the folksiest <laughs> phrase that, that stands out to me. So yeah, I don't blame you for, for hearing it that way, for sure. <laughs> it was a new one for me, but I mean, we could always find a metaphor and a raisin also. <laughs> That's true. That is true. Just put it in some water and it gets all plump, just like your life. And uh, I love that. uh, (laughs) So next question, what was the number one thing holding you back from becoming a woman of value? The number one thing that was holding me back was thinking that my only value was in being service to others. And it's tricky because I do think that part of my value and part of the reason I'm on this earth is to help prop other people up and help them articulate who they are and what they want to say. But that is not my only value. And I think that part of what I have struggled with for so long is thinking that the only value and the only affirmation of my worth has to come from other people. Yeah, I think that's also so relatable. (laughs) Something that really shifted for me in that regard was getting paid a lot of money for my value (laughs) by the people who valued what I was offering. I think that when we offer value to people who don't appreciate, then it becomes very self-defeating giving advice to people who don't want to hear it. You know, something I started doing with my children was saying, I have a lot of tools I could share with you. Let me know if you're ready. You know, because again, we, we're we exhausted from overperforming, overgiving, overdoing. But when you are hired and somebody appreciates, then the value you give in being of service is appreciated so much. That's exactly right. I love how you phrased that too, offering things to people who don't value us, because that sometimes you have to just stop and say, you know what, maybe my revenue is going to be a little bit lower this month. And that is just going to have to be okay. Because what I'm not going to do, start cutting my value down, just to hit that bottom line and end up working with a lot of people that are feeding those negative feelings of self-worth into me. I only want to be with people that we can pour into each other and uplift each other and value each other. Absolutely. I I was just telling one of my kids that I never regretted saying no to somebody who was willing to pay me, but wasn't the right fit. It just would never work. And it would have driven both of us crazy. So the money will come by the right people when you're out there and you're doing the right work. So I, I just, I think people need to remember that don't compromise your value for anyone, whether it's work, life, friendships, romantic relationships, it's, it's not worth it ever. Exactly. Right. Yep. It's going to drain all your energy and you're not going to be able to go off to get the better ones. No, or be your best. Sure. (laughs) Um, What is the best advice that you can give to a woman who wants to become more empowered? Empowerment comes from healing. And that is such a difficult thing. If you are an overachiever, you're somebody that's always over-delivering and going for the very tippy top external validation. I think it's really hard to heal when you are at your maximum work capacity. So for me, being able to start healing has been taking sabbaticals, um, you know, not necessarily in the traditional academic sense, although I did that, but more in, you know, stepping away and saying, if, if it's only a day, if it's only a week, can I stop and reconnect with who I am and who I want to be, who I, how I see myself, 
how I see the others around me. And I always find that when I take a little time, when I rest and really let myself heal, that my thoughts just change completely. When you get tired, it's that, you know, toddlers are like this. They're tired and they're grouchy and they throw tantrums and they yell at other people. And I think adults get like that too, is if we get so tired, then we just berate ourselves and, you know, we judge the people that we see around us, which of course we know when you judge people around you, it's, it comes back on you and you start to wonder, oh, well, yeah, but I also am, you know, X, Y, Z terrible thing. <laughs> so the healing has to be, the healing has to be at the center. And one thing that I have seen in a lot of my clients is that owning your story and really claiming the things that you have done the great things that you've done, as well as the mistakes you've made, the things that you've overcome, the barriers that you faced can be such a powerful way to start that process because it helps you see yourself as someone that deserves to be healed, someone that deserves to be at the center of your own life. And I, I find that when you take that path and when you can really focus on who you are and what you have brought to this world, that it's so helpful to give yourself permission to rest and be happy with what you do. It's so important to rest. It's so important to relax and balance your life because if all you're doing is serving others all the time that you don't take time for yourself, you're so depleted and you're not operating at your best at all. You can't even know what that is because you're, you're exhausted. So that's great to take sabbaticals. It's great to even just take a few moments during the day and breathe and have some kind of mindfulness practice because otherwise we're just listening to all those external voices instead of what's going on inside. Oh, that's exactly right. Just the quiet, just to stop and not have a podcast on, although this one's, <laughs> listen to this one and then then turn it off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just being quiet with yourself. It's so rare today. We're on our devices all the time, just listening, doing multitasking, just take some moments to breathe, to relax, to replenish, yeah. re-nourish yourself. And that brings me to my next question. What advice would you give to your younger self? I love this question. And the the um, jokey but not jokey answer is get in therapy right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, and truly, I do actually believe that everyone can benefit from therapy and or life coaching. But I wanted to I wanted to bring something that was that was a little more attuned with how I'm looking at the world at this particular moment. And the advice that I would give is to be unapologetically joyful, because I find that you know, we haven't gone into this, but um, my work when I was in the academy was on social movements and thinking about how social movements make change in the world. And that progressive politics is still really, really important to me. And one thing that I think gets forgotten when I look at how people talk about these different mo movements for change that have sprung up and, and, and resurged in the past couple of years is I think we often forget that the purpose of those movements is to make joy more equitable, to give access to the things that make our lives happy. So it is a fight. It is always a fight and it's hard and things will not go the way you want. But if there isn't joy and love and happiness on the other side, what even is the point? So I wish that I had been much more lenient with myself, stopped with the kind of self-disciplining talk and really thought more about where can we find and encourage joy in our lives and the lives of those around us. I love that. Be unapologetically joyful and get some therapy right now. <laughs> <laughs> Both of them. They will help each other, truly. It's true. It's true. <laughs> I, I think we can't see what we can't see. And I think the, the other thing I was thinking about when you talked about all the self-discipline stuff I think in some ways it's important to have that in order to realize that you need to let go of it because there's something about that restriction that gives you permission to let go. That's interesting. Yeah. In art, because um, I'm also an artist, it's important to learn the discipline of art in order to be the most free and creative because you're working within a structure of 
of discipline. And then, then you have the knowledge and the ability to just have the confidence to let go and let your, your true style come through. So I think, you know, we, we do have to go through processes to get to where we are today. And it seems so crazy that in order to be truly ourselves, we have to work so hard because it should be the most <laughs> natural thing, but it's not, unfortunately. And um, so I, I, I don't know, I'm just thinking about that as you were talking that, that maybe it is part of the process and we need to kind of reach those moments, even that the guy screaming at you moment, you know, it's that wake up call because we've been acting a certain way. Otherwise we wouldn't know what doesn't work for us either. Oh, that's such a great point. Well, and, and as you were talking about in terms of art, that resonates so much with me. Um, when I coach people, I will often find that that folks will be resistant to a genre. You know, well, this is the genre and we want to kind of make sure that we're fitting within this type of book and then we're taking our creativity within what our readers are going to expect or the industry if they're wanting to get a book contract. And I always describe it as a dog park. So I have dogs. And if I'm going to take my dogs to a dog park, it better be fenced, right? Because I don't want to let them off the leash running around. If there's no, you know, nothing's going to stop, nothing is going to stop them from going out into traffic. And that fence is a restriction. But in that case, the fence actually is so much encouragement for my dogs to just go nuts and run around and not have to worry about anything. I don't have to worry about anything. I can just sit and hang out and relax. And I think of that fence in our life sometimes is, is the creativity that happens within a fence can actually be much more profound and much more accessible than when we're trying to be creative in every single aspect of that thing we're trying to do. Mm, dog park, good analogy. <laughs> I've got so many thoughts running around in my head right now. <laughs> I, I'm thinking about boundaries because boundaries can be fences as well. And without boundaries, we don't have healthy relationships. So it, it gives us the permission to be freer within the context of what we set up and the agreements we have with people. So these things are so important for us. Um, this is, a, we could have a whole podcast just on that topic. <laughs> Agreed. I would love it. Next question is one that I love. What is something that people often get wrong about you? What I hear a lot is that people will, will apologize to me for not having degrees, all of the degrees. And that is not something that that particularly matters to me or that particularly tells me about how valuable your ideas and contributions are. I wanted to get, and actually I wanted to get degrees. I remember when I, when I was finishing my master's and going on to PhD school and my mentor was like, it's really hard to get a job. I want you to know if you're, if you're going to go this direction, I will support you, but it's going to be really hard to get a job. And I said, I actually just want to go to see if I can do it. And that is why I went. I just wanted to see if I could do it. And it, I, I could have just as easily gone a different way and had just as much valuable information to share. So um, a lot of times people will interpret kind of my background as believing that only if you have gone full tilt into academia, all the degrees, do I think that you are a valuable person and you have stuff to share. And that is absolutely not true at all. Uh, I couldn't agree more with that. This is uh, something I fight with people about in the dating world where they're looking for somebody with high degrees and they think that equals intelligence and you know, excitement, interest. It's really not an indication of relational skills for sure. But it, I mean, it means that you've had the discipline to sit through a number of years of, of higher education, and you often will come out with a lot of really interesting ideas and thoughts, and you have discipline. But there's so many ways to be valued and to show intelligence. And I think we have to have a broader view of what that means. Yeah, we actually have published two books last year. Uh, by authors who had not finished high school. And they are some of the most insightful, interesting, funny books that I've had the pleasure of writing. It does not mean, um, you know, because you didn't go to college or you didn't get a PhD, that your experiences aren't valuable because those are different experiences than the people that have PhDs are talking about. <laughs> I think we need more variety in how we think about what it means to live in this world. 
I do too. And often people with higher degrees will write in a way that's actually not accessible to the general public. And they'll speak that way too. And I feel that it's, it, it is off-putting because you want to be more inclusive, hopefully. And when you're writing, you want people to read it and want to keep reading and not have to look up every other word and show you, oh, I'm so smart. I know these big <laughs> words. <laughs> Million dollar words just That's scattered right. around the book. <laughs> keep it at a sixth grade level. You'll do really well. <laughs> That's exactly right. Sixth grade. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> And finally, Amanda, how would you like to be remembered? I would like to be remembered as a mentor, a confidant, a storyteller. I would like to be remembered as someone that helped so many amazing women leaders really step into their power and their voice and bring so much good into the world. Mm, I love it. Well, you're doing that and you're doing a good job of it. Um, and it's, it's a beautiful thing. I think that we need more people like you who can help people step into their value. Um, so thank you for sharing all of this, all of your story, all of everything that you have done and how you have moved through your careers to find your value in this world and to help other people find theirs. Well, thank you so much for having me. This has been a fantastic conversation. Really appreciate it. To everybody else who is listening, we really appreciate you. And if you love our show, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts and share this podcast with anyone who could benefit. If you would like to step more fully into your value, grab a free copy of The Ultimate Guide to Becoming a Woman of Value on my website, thewomanofvalue.com. Just click the link at the top of the homepage. And if you haven't already done so, be sure to click the subscribe button in your listening app. And if there's something in this episode that inspired you, please share it with others. Because the more we share these inspirational stories, the more women of value we will have in this world. I'll see you next time.